Um, hello everyone, my name is Julia and I'm at the Quartal Institute of Art. Um, I'm in my second year, but I'm only Chase funded since this year. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting to meet everyone and yeah, be part of that community, so to speak. Um, I'm going to present to you basically the research that I've done so far. Um, I finished two chapter drafts um, and I've tried to use four examples of these, so there's going to be some images. Um, my basic research is about, I'm interested in how Czech and Austrian culture, popular culture, um, how they responded to each other because there was a long shared history um, and how that developed in the interwar years when both become, um, became independent nation states. Um, yeah, so I'm looking at a period between 1918 and 1921 in this case, but my overall research spans over the interwar years. Um, yeah. Um, so the shift of power relations between the new republics of German, Austria and Czechoslovakia in the aftermath of the Great War was significant. Um, Austria only inherited a fraction of the population and territory of the Habsburg Empire and lost much of its industry to Czechoslovakia. Overwhelmed by territorial loss and financial burdens, it was the, definiti the definitive loser of the war. By contrast, Czechoslovakia was celebrated, but not un unproblematic. Constructed as an artificial union between Czechs and Slovaks, a quarter of its 13.4 million inhabitants was German, while Hungarians, Poles and Ruthenians also represented a sizable part of the population. Despite this multi-ethnic makeup, only the Czechs and Slovaks were so-called state-forming people. Um, all the other nations were minorities, um, and that caused a lot of uh, discontent as each nation struggled to make their voice heard. Um, in my chapters, in the first chapter, um, I consider visual responses to these contentious environments in caricature, um, considering Stenja Kratochwil, he was a caricaturist from the turn of the century, um, who argued that as caricature concerns itself with modern life, it is the closest to a modern art that can exist. Um, so in the first chapter, I assess the effects of the formation of Austrian and Czechoslovak of Austrian Czechoslovakia's nation states um, and what um, effect that had on perceptions of the self and the other in the immediate post-war years in 1918 and 19. Um, and to do so today, I only focus on old bourgeois satirical magazines. Um, overall, I'm looking at um, magazines that um, are directed at different stratas of the population. Um, but I think that if I just show you the old bourgeois ones, um, it will give a better comparison for time's sake. Um, so the two magazines I'm looking at today are Wiener Karikaturen, which is a Viennese um, magazine, and Ne Boise, which was published in Prague. Um, and then in the second chapter, um, I consider how the image of modern women was used to consolidate popular political identities in the early 1920s. Um, and the magazines I've chosen today to show you that is uh, the Viennese Die Muskete and the Prague Humoristische Listi. Um, so Reconciliation, the caricature we see here, um, was published on the cover of Wiener Karikaturen in December 1919, um, showing an old gentleman bowing in front of a striking figure in folk costume, who demandingly stretches out his hand. The caption reads, I destroyed the empire, weakened the value of the crown, but I forgive you everything and I'm prepared to sign a contract with you. The old man is the Austrian first chancellor Renner, standing in opposition to a demanding representation of a check. At the caricature state of publication, Renner had just recently returned from the peace negotiations at Saint-Germain, where Austria re remained unheard in its plea to join Germany um, as to sort of form a federation. Um, and it also had to make huge territorial concessions, um, most notably the German-speaking Sudetenlands to Czechoslovakia. The historian Arnold Zuban argues that the image of the Czech um, was traditionally used to show his inferiority through a visualization of animalistic features. The author compares ethnic stereotypes from the Habsburg Empire and to a limited extent its follow-up states, 
arguing that they had a greater influence than the ever-changing political ideological programs within increasing national tensions. He anchors his argument in the history of identity formation within the empire, showing how the continuation of historical conflicts was enforced through heterostereotypes concerned with the other and autostereotypes focused on the self. In line with Subon's argument, the Czech in reconciliation had a well-established tradition, manifesting the stereotype that the Czechs were servile to superiors and ruthlessly domineering to inferiors. Even the broadly flared sleeves on his blouse appears a visualization of excess in reference to the demands made by the Czechs. The caricature thus acknowledges that Czechoslovakia was in a stronger position than Austria as one of the winners of the war and protégés of the Allies, um, and enforces the stereotype of a ruthless nation. Yet as the caricature juxtaposes an Austrian statesman with a Czech type, the image also clings on to a pre-war status quo when German Austrians tended to be in stronger political and social uh, positions than their Czech counterparts. The caricature indicates an Austrian non-understanding of the fact that it ceased to be a dominant nation in East Central Europe yet externalizes the cause for this by enforcing the image of the Czech culprit. And so the caricature exemplifies the demoralized mood that was present in the Austrian public in 1918 and 1919 and shows attachment to a time past. This atmosphere of misery in Austria begs the question how the um, events of separation and independence featured in the caricature of Czechoslovakia, which was celebrated as a victorious nation yet also subjected to a host of difficulties linked to its past under Habsburg rule. An interesting example to assess this um, is Resurrection, which was published in Neboiser in April 1919. Neboiser's editor-in-chief was Karel Čapek, whose Friday meetings were frequented by the Czechoslovak president Tomáš Masaryk. The, art history, uh, sorry, the historian Andrea Orsov um, emphasizes that at these meetings, um, where lots of political matters would be discussed in a sort of um, unofficial way, um, so at these meetings not a single German speaker or Slovak um, were attending the meetings, which indicates a Czech drive to cultivate an identity that excluded the other national groups present in the country. Um, also links the president's circles, the printing press, and this idea of myth-making, um, arguing that they propagated an idea of Czech democracy at home and abroad and kept national squabbles under tight control in the until the 1930s. Um, but um, satirical mag magazines show that within popular culture, actually, um, the opposite was true in a way. Um, so resurrection depicts two military men in front of a coffin inscribed with the words, the grave of Czech independence. A naked female floats from the casket one hand raised in a Christ-like gesture. Considering the interplay between rough execution and stylization of the figures, resurrection becomes a symbol for the rebirth of Czechoslovakia, which taps into timeless symbolism with Christian allegory, yet is firmly placed into the now um, in its expressionist form. The messianic image implies Czech independence as a God-given right, reflecting the myth-making process current throughout the First Republic. Um, yet the grave proclaims only the death of Czech independence, thus, thus also focusing on a Czech resurrection, which raises a problem considering that there were two state-forming people, Czechs and Slovaks. The caricature thus raises the question of Czech hegemony over the Slovaks and other national groups present in the country at the time. Moreover, fun is made of the Austro-German claim for superiority, um, which provides a counterpart to reconciliation, where the Czech superiority is ridiculed. But the most striking difference between um, resurrection here and um, reconciliation um, is the way that the local nationality is represented. In reconciliation, um, Renner represents the new de democratic Austria. Um, so he's a real figure whose politics are supported in the, in the caricature, but in the magazine on the whole as well. Um, by contrast, the representative for the Czech nation is an angel who has transcended death and brings its old perpetrators to their knees. So we have quite different um, perceptions of um, what 
the, the own nation is and who the culprit is of the actual breakup of the Habsburg Empire. Um, but despite these contrasting atmospheres of misery and celebration, the countries also shared some developments. Um, so universal suffrage was introduced in 1919 in both countries, um, and the Great War, um, like in many other places in Europe, um, had been a catalyst for a change in women's roles on a significant scale. As it became more visible in the public sphere, women's emancipation was a popular topic in the early 1920s in both Austrian and Czechoslovak satirical magazines, um, where gender roles carried political connotations as much as societal ones. Melissa Feinberg argues that gender equality played a significant part in Czechoslovakia's presentation as innately democratic, and it was anchored, anchored in the country's constitution of 1920. Um, Czechoslovakia was also the first country in Europe um, who had um, a sort of equivalent of a female MP. Um, so she was immediately voted into, into parliament. Um, in Austria, by contrast, the yearning to go back to the good old days um, implied a conservatism where women remained associated with the domestic. Official attitudes were far less advanced in Czechoslovakia than in Czechoslovakia and heavily depended on party politics. Um, the Social Democrats, which was the sort of left wing um, of Austrian politics, asked women to participate in the class war while the conservative Christian socials, who were also um, very pro-Habsburg still, um, they were committed to traditionalist views of women in the home. Um, Tennis Girls was published in the Muscete in August 1920. Um, so it, there's a poem below the images, and even though they're separate authors, um, the caricature was done by someone called Fritz Schönflug, the poem by... Um, a writer using the pseudonym Jeremias, um, but it's to be read together. Um, in its literary content, the modern woman is described as sporty with an unfeminine figure, drinking whiskey in breaks from her tennis game. The final stanza concludes, that's why on hot summer days I know nothing sadder than to watch these girls as they throw white balls with passion and, do, and then go outside longing for a man they won't find. <laughs> The drawings depict five women bearing the physical features described in the poem, emphasizing that smoking, drinking, and sports make women unattractive and unhappy. The strange form of femininity um, also implies an Anglophile lifestyle. The poem is titled Tennis Girls, um, and it contains words like tennis ladies and outside in English, implying that the modern woman is a foreign phenomenon. Yet while the poem predominantly judges women, the caricature suggests a more ambivalent relation between the sexes. Whenever both genders are present, the man is confused in the face of woman's actions. His weakened position is also underlined in the drawing technique. The women's black stockings and opaque black hair lift them into the center of attention, um, while the men are drawn in schematic and abbreviated lines. Tennis girls thus depicts men not in control of the situation they are in symbolizing not only Austrian masculinity, but the Republic as a whole. Um, and I'm basing this on an, on, on an argument by Ingrid Sharp, in which she, she says that modern women were seen as the antithesis of the kind needed to regenerate a nation in post-war Germany, as they were considered a threat to women's traditional role as wives, as wives and mothers, um, and that role was necessary in order to revive the nation after the war. Um, while Sharp speaks about Germany, um, the first Austrian Republic was in very similar difficulties at the time. Um, so I would assume that there was a comparable rhetoric present in Austria. Um, there are several very popular books at the time. Um, one is by Otto Weininger, which was called Sex and Character, in which he argues, for an example, that um, women, women don't need emancipation um, because they would only take on male traits and that wouldn't really make sense. And it, it was actually first published in 1902, um, but there were over 20 editions and it was popular throughout the interwar years. Um, so, because the tennis girls um, also carry anglicized connotations with them, um, 
the, the fact that modern women are detrimental to the health of the nation um, also relates to the allies. Um, and that creates a parallel between an Austrian man and the nation. Um, and it sort of implies that both are suffering not through their own fault, again, um, but through the detrimental influences of some kind of other. In Czechoslovakia, by contrast, gender equality related to the democratic national ideal. However, just as celebrations of independence ignored national tensions, gender equality was not as integral a part of the nation as was asserted. Different Ways Towards the Same Goal was published in Humoristic Listi in December 1921, depicting seven women in revealing dresses running towards an altar where a priest awaits them. The activities they are shown to be doing identify them as modern women. And as the image is composed in the colors of the Czech, Czechoslovak flag, red, blue, and white, um, I must apologize if it looks orange. It's my reproduction rather than <laughs> anything else. Um, but because the colors are similar to the Czech flag, um, a link between modern women and the nation is implied. Um, but considering the erot erotic emphasis on their bodies, the women are framed from a male perspective and their position is undermined in the accompanying poem, which states that women's activities are only fashionable new ways to find a husband, destabilizing the notion that they could make any decision independently. Moreover, the women seem to match the social class of the male reader, the urban haute bourgeoisie, and this also defines the nationality. Given that the biggest urban center in 1920s Czechoslovakia was Prague, and the figures most certainly represent specifically Czech rather than Slovak, German, or Hungarian women. As such, different ways towards the same goal aligns progressive women with Czech rather than Czechoslovak identity. Comparing tennis girls and different ways towards the same goal, um, it appears that both illustrate men's concerns about the impact women's independence may have on them. The former implies that women will never find a husband if they keep behaving in this modern manner, um, while the latter suggests um, that women use the same kind of behavior only to find a man. Both caricatures respond to the modern woman with skepticism, even though women's emancipation played a vital role in the national ideology of the first Czechoslovak Republic, while in Austria the traditional gender roles were adhered to with the notion that they could save the nation. Moreover, as Die Muskete and Humoristitzke Listi were directed at a male or bourgeois audience, their conservative gender image um, appealed to a particular strata of society, and that was those who were content with the com contemporary situation and didn't feel a need for change. So to conclude, um, the caricatures in both countries in the immediate post-war years um, they first and foremost respond to the, moon, the, the mood of gain or loss. Um, with the use of ethnic stereotypes, um, they accentuate political and ideo ideological conflicts rooted in the history of the Habsburg Empire, showing that at the beginning, differences in Czech and Austrian mentality were mapped out well in content and in form. One is the forward-looking winner, seen here, um, and the other as the nostalgic loser. However, representations of national and political identities shift in the early 1920s. As new sociopolitical realities were manifested, Austrian and Czechoslovak haute bourgeois satirical magazines become similar in content and both assess a conservative status quo for the male urban haute bourgeois reader. Um, so, this is where I'm at at the moment. Um, I normally also include, as I said before, satirical magazines um, directed to the working classes, for an example. Um, and it's quite interesting to see how, at the beginning, Czech caricatures feature um, Austrian stereotypes a lot in the first two years, um, and then they slowly subside. And in the Austrian... Um, in the Austrian examples, um, we have examples like this, um, but then not that many where they directly refer to um, 
Czechoslovakia. However, there is always, in the Austrian context, there is always some other that's guilty of something. Um, whereas the Czech caricatures are a lot more positive, which I relate to the fact that Czechoslovakia had wanted to be independent for many, many years. Um, so there was a much more celebratory mood. Um, but I'll see what I find when I get to the 30s, which changes the situation, of course. Thank you.